Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, excited to host uh, an important discussion uh, on infrastructure in Latin America. Uh, one of the little stories I always tell uh, in my class at Columbia University was uh, we would pull out the numbers of, of paved roads that uh, many Latin American countries had. I remember in one case, and this is the 1990s, Peru, only 30% of its roads were paved. And you have to cons consider that probably most of those were in the capital city of Lima and a handful of other larger cities, meaning that a large part of that country's economy was obviously distant from ports and other places in which its goods could be shipped overseas. And therefore also its um, overall sort of society and politics were also divided, something we've seen actually very, very uh, sharply given the recent elections in Peru. And this is a reminder that infrastructure is important not just for people's day-to-day -day existence, but it's also important for creating national economies, for building export-based economies, and even for politics and societies. And that's becoming true, especially now we talk about digital in, uh, infrastructure as well. Digital infrastructure in a world in which um, digitization and access to the internet is going to shape how we receive information, how we connect to schools, how even students have been able to connect to schools during the COVID lockdowns, as well as being able to innovate uh, and create is going to be equally important. So now the question is, is how can we begin to address this? How can we understand uh, these gaps? How can we improve upon them? And how can we enlist the support of public sector, multilateral banks and the private sector to improve uh, this uh, critical area uh, for uh, the global economy and for uh, economies within Latin America? I'm delighted we have uh, two here uh, three individuals from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank and Beatrice Uribe from the um, from CEMEX to talk about the private sector's view when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, they'll be talking about a uh, report that they recently produced on connecting the hemisphere uh, and its economic impact and ways to address it. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over to Malcolm Greer in a second, but let me introduce the panelists. Uh, Malcolm is the Alternative Executive Director for the UK and Japan and Korea and a handful of other countries uh, before the Inter-American Development Bank. Before that, he was at, at DFID and has a long career in development, development assistance uh, from the UK. Uh, Andy, or Andrew Powell, is, a, uh, was, is the uh, director of the research institute the, uh, in, in the IDB before that. Uh, he was at one time, which I found curious, uh, he was the chief economist for the Central Bank of Argentina. Um, in 1996 and uh, has helped lead this report in the overall research generation within the IDB. Well, Tomas Serebritsky is the uh, Principal Economic Advisor for Infrastructure and the Environment in the IDB. He has a PhD from the University of Chicago uh, and has a long history also in academia and as an economist. And last is Beatriz Oribe. She's the Vice President for Corporate Affairs at CEMEX um, and she'll be offering her views on uh, the actual private sector role of addressing infrastructure and addressing improvements in these uh, particular areas. But um, Malcolm, why don't I turn it over to you to uh, give a few opening remarks on the IDB report, your role, and uh, what we hope will be a, a longer term collaboration between uh, the IDB and Chatham House in its Latin American issue. Malcolm? Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction and welcome everybody. Thanks for giving us your time today. Uh, and thanks also to Chatham House for organizing this event within the US of the Americas program. Um, Chatham House prides itself, of course, on being a disruptor in the positive sense of the word. And as such, it's an appropriate venue for a presentation of the IDB's 2020 flagship report, uh, The Path to Better Infrastructure in Latin America and the Caribbean, which looks at the future for energy, transport and water and, tra and sanitation. One of the key themes of the book is precisely how infrastructure services are being disrupted due to a combination of new technologies and other drivers for change. The main argument is that revolutionary change is coming. Technology is not just bringing us new products or better batteries at cheaper cost, but it's also disrupting the very nature of the markets and services. There are dangers here, but there are also immense opportunities, provided policies can be implemented to take advantage of more competitive and likely more decentralized markets and ensure higher quality and cleaner services at better prices. As the book argues, technological advances coupled with the incorrect policies could even provoke bad outcomes and deepen inequalities in access and in the quality of service provision. 
This is, of course, not only true for Latin America and the Caribbean. And there are likely areas where the UK can provide lessons for the region and possibly vice versa. Back in the 1990s, many countries in the region embraced the changes in industrial structure and regulation pioneered by the UK and mostly to good effect. The book does a fine job in reviewing some of the lessons learned 30 years on. The next great experiment, if you like, will be how countries manage the technological and climate challenges in the context of acute social challenges. For the 26 countries that borrow from the Inter-American Development Bank, these themes are perhaps even more pressing than for a richer country such as the UK. The region did not fare well in 2020. As detailed in the IDB's 2021 Latin America and Caribbean macroeconomic report, the region has just 8% of the world population, but accounted for more than 25% of the global deaths due to COVID last year. It was not just a health and humanitarian crisis, of course, but also an economic crisis with a recession of 7% of GDP, the largest loss in a single year since the independence struggles in the mid-19th century. Although still deep in crisis, it appears that new cases are now falling in most countries. Recent projections put economic growth at 5.8% for this year and 3.2% for 2022, buoyed by higher expected growth in larger economies such as Brazil and Mexico. One of the recommendations from the IDB to boost that recovery, to make it more sustained over time, and to ensure it is inclusive and climate friendly, is to increase spending on the right types of infrastructure. Unfortunately, investment in infrastructure, which was low even before the pandemic, has further dwindled. Availability of financing may be one of the most significant constraints for the coming years. As a consequence of the pandemic, fiscal deficits soared. Public debt rose to 72% of GDP. The IDB estimates that public debt could continue to rise to around 76% of GDP by 2023 before starting to decline. In these difficult times, the space for public investment in infrastructure will be limited. At the same time, private investment has also fallen. There is a need to find ways to reverse that trend. High quality investment frameworks are key. They will both attract more private investment and ensure that the quality of the infrastructure developed is high. In these circumstances, the flows from the multilateral development banks such as the IDB are also critical. Their ability to provide rapid and substantial counter-cyclical finance as they did after the 2008 financial crisis and again last year in response to the pandemic is, is the key value of these institutions within the international financial system. But there's a lively debate about whether MDBs can further boost their lending within current capital levels whilst maintaining the, their AAA rating, which allows them to finance long term at low rates. To inform this debate, the G20 is about to commission an analysis of capital adequacy right across the multilateral system. As the largest multilateral financer in Latin America and the Caribbean, the IDB is an important platform for delivering UK priorities in the region, providing a channel for financial support, as well as an impressive knowledge and research agenda, and its convening power and credibility with the region's governments and policy makers. One of the UK's highest regional priorities relates to climate change and our COP26 presidency. We're encouraging the IDB to use its resources and its policy influence to help countries build back better from the COVID crisis. The UK continues to be a committed friend and partner to this region of over 650 million people and combined GDP of around $5 trillion. As the UK seeks new trade alliances, ensuring a healthy and growing LAC region will also be important for UK firms. Events such as today's provide a platform for the exchange of ideas and I hope that the UK and countries in Latin America and the Caribbean can continue to learn from each other about what has worked well and what has not worked so well. So let me conclude by once again thanking uh, Chatham House for hosting this event. And we look forward, as Chris said, to further opportunities to collaborate in the future. The IDB produces a stream of interesting and provocative research on the region, so there's certainly no lack of suitable topics. Back to you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Malcolm. And again, I want to reiterate, I hope this is the start of a, to quote, uh, Casablanca, a beautiful relationship. The, um, on that point, too, I think one of the questions I want to get to in the question answer period uh, later, but is, is what is necessary to jumpstart um, interest and investment uh, in this critical sector? Because it has lagged, as you mentioned, in the past. The question is, not just given fiscal constraints now because of COVID, what's necessary both in the private sector, multilateral banks and the like, especially at a time when competition is coming from China, the Belt and Road Initiative answering a very uh, critical need uh, for investment in infrastructure. 
not to answer those questions necessarily, but to present the report, I'm going to turn it to Andrew, please. Andrew, take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd also like to add um, the thanks to everybody there, to Christopher Sabatini and the staff at Chatham House um, for, for organizing this. This is a great opportunity to, to present our, our flagship report um, known as Development in the Americas series um, from structures to services, the path to better infrastructure in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's the first time we're presenting in the, in the UK. Uh, it's a shame that it's virtual and not a physical event, but I, I do hope we can organize further events and in person as well in, in the future. Um, this report was co-edited by Eduardo Cavallo, Tomas Serrisky and myself, and Tomas and I will be sharing the presentation today. So I will start off and then uh, Tomas will um, deliver the second part of the, the yeah. presentation. Andy, you got just check that um, everybody can see the presentation. I'm sharing, is it? Yeah, perfect, yeah. great. I think we're yeah. good, great. thank we're good. you. Let yeah. me just start by summarizing the main messages of the book. Um, first, the report argues that there's a need to shift focus from structures to services. So we should focus more on the software of infrastructure, including issues such as governance, regulation, efficiency of providers and consumer behavior. Second, Latin America and the Caribbean has to invest more and invest better. And as Malcolm mentioned, unfortunately, investment in infrastructure fell before COVID, the COVID crisis, and during the COVID crisis fell by even more. Uh, we do think there are ways to boost investment to answer Chris's comments just now. Uh, we think we know how to do this. We just need to find the right policies and, and, and find ways to implement them efficiently. Third, the future will bring disruption, as, as Malcolm mentioned, enabled by digitalization with huge opportunity. The region needs to improve connectivity to uh, take full advantage of those and adapt policy frameworks to realize these benefits. Fourth, improving services can boost both growth and reduce income inequality. So there is a win-win here. And as the region recovers from the COVID crisis, this is even more important than ever to get this right. Fifth, explicit sustainable infrastructure and decarbonization strategies are required to address the climate challenges. And finally, improving governance and ensuring regulation adapts for the future will be critical to ensure better services and affordable services uh, for all. So the starting point is this shift in focus from structures to services, where, where structures are the hardware, the water treatment plants, the sewage plants, the electric power plants, the voltage lines, the roads, the train tracks, etc. And a lot of discussion on infrastructure just tends to focus on structures. But here we want to shift the focus to services and, and analyze the issues such as the customer experience, the quality of the services provided, how consumers behave, the governance and regulation of the sectors, and the efficiency of both the public and private companies, the service providers. And much of the book then is focused on these elements. Let me just focus on three things in this short presentation. The first one being access. Latin America has actually made a lot of progress here, particularly uh, in some sectors such as electricity, where most countries are now close to universal access. But these statistics can be a bit misleading. Uh, access, should, uh, access could be far from a desirable minimum standard. Let's take the case of water and sanitation. So while statistics say nearly 97% of the population in the region has access to drinking water, that may unfortunately mean a 15 minute walk from home to reach a safe water source. And access drops by 14 percentage points if it's defined as having running water at home. So one has to be a bit careful with these statistics. Now, once access is available, the second element is then quality. Accessing electricity without power cuts or ensuring the drinking water is clean and with adequate pressure, et cetera. And while quality has indeed improved in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, it has actually not improved as much in this other, as other developing regions. So there is, if you like, a, a quality gap, which has been growing. But accessing good quality services is of little use if people cannot afford them. So the third element is affordability. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, people spend more on electricity, water, transportation, and communications than in other regions, particularly those uh, families in lower income, income groups. So this still suggests that affordability is a barrier. For example, in surveys, uh, we found that 40% of the poor in the region 
make the main journey of the day by foot, while um, that's the case for only 10% of the wealthiest families. That would be fine if work, walking were a choice, but that does not seem to be the case. The problem is more likely that the poor cannot afford the costs of public, let alone their own transportation uh, services. More generally, paying for a consumption basket of services that mimics that of households in advanced economies would demand more than 40% of household income in some cities in the region. So unfortunately, for many low-income families, services still remain out of reach due to their costs. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, we need to invest more in basic infrastructure services to improve access uh, with the right definition, improve quality and affordability. Investing more is critical to bridging the current infrastructure gaps. And even before the COVID crisis, as has been mentioned, infra investment infrastructure was low. It was just 2.8% of GDP uh, in the period 2008 to 2017, well below that of East Asia and the Pacific and mid the Middle East and North Africa. Public investment is low, it's been averaging about 2% of GDP over that period, and private investment even lower, less than 1% of GDP on average. And moreover, there's been a declining trend with a clear bias against investment within public spending. And that fell to even lower levels, as, as has been mentioned, because of the COVID crisis. But it's not just the quantity of investment, it's the quality of investment that also matters. In fact, quantity and quality are intimately related, and, it, and in particular through the nature of the investment framework. A lack, unfortunately, a lack of adequate planning, weak governance, and poor implementation impacts investment through whatever delivery vehicle that is adopted, whether that be private or public, through procurement systems or three, through PPPs and the like. In this regard, we analyzed a sample of 200 investment projects in Latin America and the Caribbean and found that 36 were canceled, 162 suffered significant delays. We estimated that an incredible 35% of the allocated resources may have been spent in cost overruns or lost due to delays. These were public projects. And since public investment in infrastructure was um, uh, over 2% per year between 2008, 2017, the potential savings could be as much as about 0.6% of GDP per year. The bottom line is that quantity and quality go hand in hand. There's little point in boosting investment unless the quality is, of that investment is good. On the other hand, reforms to improve quality should also attract higher and especially greater private investment. But much of the book is perspective, looking forward rather than back. So let me turn now to what we refer to as the drivers for change. The first one listed in this slide has become even more urgent thanks to the COVID crisis, which has clearly deepened the high levels of inequality in the region. Actually, the IDB has recently published an inequality report. So please refer to that for more information on, on those issues. The implication for the topic of infrastructure, however, is that new infrastructure plans or projects need then to consider how they will impact the welfare of poorer households and whether they will have a positive impact on, on uh, equality. Most dramatically, it was the price hikes of services that sparked protests and social unrest when transport tariffs were increased in Brazil in 2013 and in Chile in 2019. And of course, the social demands have become even more pressing as a result of the COVID crisis. The second driver for change is climate. In the last 50 years, the frequency of natural disasters in Latin America and the Caribbean has tripled. And the economic damage to roads, buildings, machinery, equipment, and crops has soared from about $7 billion in the first decade shown in this graph to over $103 billion in the last decade illustrated here. As many have already noticed, we are now uh, have already noted we are now living witnesses of the impacts of climate change. 2020 hurricane season was unprecedented in terms of the number of named storms, and the 2021 season has already produced um, some severe weather events. Natural disasters affect both structures and service provision. Floods destroy the structures, uh, and we've all seen the the, the pictures of that but they can also pollute water sources and increase disease transmission. 
But it's not just storms. Brazil, for example, is currently suffering a major drought affecting agricultural production and the provision of hydroelectric power. It is argued in the book that time is fast running out. And as well as boosting resilience, countries in the region must do their part and take strong actions to move uh, towards zero net emissions. Finally, let me turn to technology as the third driver of change. Attempting to predict the future in the face of rapid potential technical change is very is daunting. There are many different paths that the world could take and it's hard to separate lightly developments from the hype, especially from interested parties that are attempting to sell their own innovation or their own preferred visions of the future. So the way that we decided to approach this topic was to construct concrete scenarios combining technological advances with different policy responses. We realized through this thought process that policies today will be critical for the future and that technological change could be a force for the good, but there are also significant dangers out there. Now, technology and innovation come in many forms, but one important common theme across all sectors can be labeled digitalization, in which we include connectivity, data collection, the analysis of that data, possibly through artificial intelligence, and the possibility to control all sorts of systems, machines and appliances in real time, and hence the ability to respond to fine price signals, assuming that those price signals exist. So now I'm gonna pass the floor to Thomas, Thomas who will continue the, the presentation, the second part of the presentation. He will start with um, the example of electricity and how technology is changing that particular sector. Thomas, please. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, let me start the, the second part of a presentation explaining with the example of electricity, the scope of changes that digitalization may bring to infrastructure services. In this slide, you can see how battery costs have fallen, but I could have shown you the cost of solar panels or wind turbines where costs have uh, also come down significantly. The reduction in the price of renewables, the lower cost of storage, coupled with digitalization is provoking a strong drive to decentralization, where firms and households will increasingly generate their own energy. Digitalization is key to manage the decentralization process. It is a key that opens the door for consumers to take control, to manage their demand and their supply in real time. Today's passive consumers will likely become active, intelligent prosumers. These changes have the potential of revolutionizing the market for electricity. In this new scenario, electricity companies will have to change their business models to survive. But there are serious dangers lurking. If higher income households and firms disconnect from the grid, the system may become underfunded, putting investment and maintenance at risk. There is likely a bad situation where um, that could be efficient for a few, but socially inefficient and more regressive. There may be some trade-offs on the horizon, which will require careful management. We need to allow the benefits of technology, but avoid what we call a dystopian future. And with the right policies, we can ensure clean energy with zero emissions for all, even in remote areas and at lower prices. The specific challenges in, in transport and water are surely different, but uh, we also develop scenarios in the book. The upshot is that technical advances with the wrong policies could lead to a negative scenario, but the combination of technological revolution and the right public policies could yield very significant opportunities for development, including for income distribution or equity. And what kind of returns might such opportunities bring? In the book, we carried out uh, simulations to measure how technological changes in infrastructure services might impact uh, the economies of the region. We did it for eight countries uh, in, in Latin America. And the results suggest that technology and the digitalization of services would strengthen economic growth. For example, a 5% increase in the productive efficiency of services, which is a modest assumption, will result in a 200 billion US billion increase in GDP over a decade, the equivalent of 3.5% of the region's GDP. But in addition, technological change should support inclusive growth and improve income distribution. The simulations suggest that the income of whole households in the economy would increase, 
but the real income of the poorest households would increase by a greater amount. Prices should fall as, co as costs come down and the benefits should be higher for poor households because they spend a greater portion of their income on basic services. But taking advantages of these changes requires connectivity. Unfortunately, Latin America lacks. We need to be mindful of this gap. For a large swath of the population, getting connected is impossible as the digital infrastructure doesn't exist or connecting is too expensive. That is why the book proposes uh, to um, produce a, a digital agenda. This includes designing uh, national broadband plans that facilitate open access to infrastructure and that promote competition. Well-targeted subsidies can be employed to achieve universal access. And the book summarizes the successful policies implemented in Chile, Mexico, and Peru in this regard. And finally, digital education is required for users to take advantage of the many opportunities that technology provides. In the remaining of the presentation, let me focus briefly on policy recommendations. As was emphasized previously by Andy, closing the infrastructure gap requires an increase in both public and private investment. The role of public investment is undeniable. The challenge for the region will be to reverse the existing bias against public investment that characterizes spending policies in Latin America. Given the trends that show a reduction in public uh, investment infrastructure, private investment must play an important role to close infrastructure gap. Of course, private investment must take place where it makes economic sense, that is in projects with high rates of return and where the private sector can innovate and provide better quality and more efficient services. And all public-private projects uh, must take place within adequate fiscal management frameworks that value and report contingent liabilities. The book emphasizes that to reduce inefficiency of investment that accounts for at least 35%, as Andy showed before, of total public investment, the region needs to invest in the investment process. And the roadmap includes five points. Develop an infrastructure plan that identifies a set of priority projects. And this is key to provide uh, predictability to the construction industry. Allocate sufficient resources to pre-investment. This is necessary to reduce contingencies and cost overruns. Stimulate competition and innovation. For example, by moving from selection criteria based on inputs and lowest prices to award criteria that prioritize service quality. Prioritize maintenance, for example, with contracts, contracts that bundle together road rehabilitation and maintenance in which the region has proven experience and contracts known as CREMA and moving from reactive to predictive maintenance, which is increasingly feasible thanks to technology and fight against corruption by improving compliance with laws, but also through targeted interventions. An example of which is the MAPA Inversiones platform already implemented in Colombia, Peru, and Costa Rica, which allows citizens to track in real time how resources are being spent. Infrastructure, as we all know, is key to mitigating the effects of climate change. Excluding emissions from land use or food production, energy generation and transport account for 70% of the region's CO2 emissions. There can be no excuses or delays. To comply with the Paris Agreement, infrastructure provision and related services must, must change today. And there is consensus among specialists on four pillars to move Latin America to a net zero carbon economy. Generate electricity from renewable sources, massively electrify industrial and residential activities and foster energy efficiency, increase the use of public and non-motorized transportation, and restore ecosystems with high carbon absorption. But simultaneously with mitigation, adaptation should be a policy priority. Many engineering options can make infrastructure more resilient. Building resilient structures, such as elevating roads, adds on average 5% to the project costs. These additional costs are offset by lower maintenance or repair costs and by avoiding the impact of interrupting services. The 5% of a multi-million dollar project is a lot, but compared with the 35% that 
that is lost through inefficient investment, it is very little. Regulation is key for the dividends of technological change to reach uh, consumers. Efficient improvements will not lead by themselves to lower prices in many infrastructure markets. A good example of how countries are striving to update their regulatory framework is the adoption of net metering policies necessary for trading energy between prosumers and utilities. As of 2019, almost all countries in the region had approved these policies. But there are many regulatory policies that hinder the efficiency of services. There are labor regulations, barriers to competition, and procurement rules that discourage innovation. The graph shows an example from commercial air transport. Regulations force airlines in Latin America to have 25% more crew than in the US to operate the same quantity of flights, which translates into higher costs for airlines in the region. Clearly, this regulation cannot be justified on safety grounds. What is clear is that going forward, regulatory frameworks must adapt to changing times. The status quo in place since the 1990s has been to have one independent regulator per service. But the boundaries among sectors are blurring due to technological changes. For instance, electricity is increasingly interrelated with transport, water, and telecommunications. Electric, electric vehicles are batteries on wheels. So how electricity storage and flows are regulated will determine the adoption of electric vehicles. And this, in turn, will affect investment needs in the electricity distribution network. And going forward, data, which will be increasingly important for optimizing supply and implementing demand management response programs, will be owned or managed by telecommunication companies. This is why collaboration between regulatory institutions has become more important than ever. Sectoral mandates may need to be reassigned. Agencies could be merged and data management supervision could be allocated to a new data agency. Changes in the regulatory compact are being led by developed countries. Some examples are the recent creation of I-bodies, infrastructure bodies, in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK with the National Infrastructure Commission. The best solution will depend on the context of each country. But what is clear is that it will be necessary to foster competition, enhance governance, adopt, adopt new policies, and rethink regulatory instruments and institutions. Let us conclude by, by saying that the book, a wide set of background papers, and other supporting materials are all available at the link provided on this slide. Thank you very much for the invitation, for listening, and I'm looking forward for questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Andy and Tomas. Uh, fascinating report, thorough uh, and, and modern. And obviously, I'm interested in hearing here what Beatrice has to say. She's worked on so many of these issues across the board, obviously, in regulation and private investment, maintenance, and of course, the issue of, of sustainability and adaptation. So, uh, Semex is, is obviously you know, the largest, uh, I, I believe, cement producer, one of the largest infrastructure companies in, in Latin America. Uh, it's actually the largest, uh, just a little anecdote for the UK, it's the largest foreign cement company in the, in the United Kingdom. I see their trucks all the time in the streets. So, Beatrice, your reflections on this report, your reflection on the state of regulation and improvements that can be made both in terms of policy uh, as well as uh, the, the, the whole process of construction and bidding. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christopher, for this invitation. And uh, thank you very, very much to the bank uh, for making us part of this discussion. I really want to congratulate the bank for this report. It has uh, made me very happy. I used to work for the bank for many years, almost 14 years. So I'm very glad to be here on the private sector side as to be able to comment this. Um, I want to congratulate the authors, and I also want to um, say hello to director um, uh, of the board in the in the board of the of the Interbank and Development Bank. Um, I like to highlight a few a few reflections that came out or that came to our mind while we we reviewing the report. Um, as it has been highlighted before, the main aspects about the report are um, financing, innovation, technology, climate change, and resilience, and of course, regulations. 
These are all topics very, very relevant for the private sector. And there is a role for the private sector in all these aspects. And I would like to, as I said, highlight a few, highlight a few reflections and of course, um, a few remarks related to our industry. Um, my reflections, our reflections. Uh, first of all, one of the challenges that we have is to close the infrastructure gap that exists in the region. And here I'm talking about South America, Central America, the Caribbean, and Mexico, where we are basically, where we have operations in um, this Latin American and Caribbean region. And um, of course, our challenge to close this infrastructure gap is far larger than the challenge that mature economies have. But now the difference is that we have to close this gap. And at the same time, we have to be able to meet our CO2 emissions reductions. We do have very aggressive targets, and I will talk about these later on. Uh, we now know that population is growing very fast and cities will face and present in demand for housing, transportation, energy, infrastructure, jobs, and basic services. What, do, what, what we do have in the region are opportunities, opportunities for investment and grow, and of course, uh, opportunities for doing this well done, as the paper says. Um, all recent events, as it was highlighted by the authors, have also shown that the crucial importance of resilience against extreme weather events and health crises like COVID uh, also pose um, an additional challenge for all of us. Accelerating urbanization demands, is, uh, demands smart construction that contributes to mitigating climate change and resource scarcity while improving social well-being. For the region to invest better in infrastructure, a collaboration with architects, engineers, developers, suppliers, and local government is key to find solution for solutions, particularly for affordable housing, efficient buildings, and resilient infrastructure. Power all this by technology innovation and a constant evolution of regulatory landscape. That was highlighted, of course, by the by this uh, technical, by this policy paper. Uh, of course, being in my position, this is an opportunity to remark that CEMEX is in a unique position to provide integrated solutions for the construction and maintenance of more sustainable and resilient cities. For us, it is critical to continue investing in resilient infrastructure while mitigating the effects of climate change. These challenges that we face right now can only be tackled from a global perspective. Construction and the construction sector plays a key role on this. To continue my, our reflections, the construction sector must face these challenges by transforming how we build as to achieve sustainable development, as I said. Sustainable practices might thrive in a resource constrained world, ensuring that all construction activities are carried out with green, resilient, resource efficient, and inclusive measures acting in the present, and of course, thinking about the future. I want to take the opportunity also, and I, I, I finish with this, to talk uh, shortly about alternative fuels and clean energy. Uh, there is a statement in the, in the paper saying, replace fossil fuels with carbon-free fuels, such as hydrogen and sustainable produced biofuels. Well, that is a mandate for us. It is a mandate for the private sector, for the industry, and for CEMEX in particular. Uh, what we're trying to do right now worldwide, we have operations in more than 50 countries. We are here in the region in more than 50 countries uh, without counting Mexico, which is a large market. Uh, and the principle is that we, uh, apply is that, that we, while we think about circular economy principles, we're, we're also trying to contribute to alleviating the waste management challenges that cities face. For those who, who know the sector in Latin America know very well that um, these challenges for cities and for the population are very, very urgent to be, uh, or have to be met in a very, very urgent, or have to be attended in a very, very urgent way. Uh, we consume over 30 times more waste than we send to landfills. And by 2030, we aim to increase, and here I'm talking about CEMEX worldwide, 
worldwide, we aim to increase by 50% the amount of waste and byproducts that we capture as alternative fuels and alternative raw materials. We have the know-how to generate, process, storage, and recover energy from waste. Co-processing waste in cement kilns is a more efficient waste management solution than landfills or incineration. We have become consumers of waste and non-recyclable byproducts for several industries, including power, iron, steel, agriculture, and municipal waste management. Now, uh, I'm among experts. I do not have to talk about the, the strength and resilience of, uh, re resilience of concrete, but I do have to mention um, a few things. Um, we need to innovate. This is something that is very much highlighted and given importance in the paper, and we need to innovate around this essential construction material, which is concrete. Concrete is the ideal construction material for us for long lasting buildings offering thermal efficiency, resilience to nature, this natural disaster and lower maintenance cost. Another key aspect of concrete is that it absorbs carbon during its build lifespan. This attribute is unique to concrete among building materials. There are no readily available substitutes for concrete with these qualities, which make it the second most consumed material in the world after water that I learned uh, a few days ago. Concrete is the second most consumed material of the planet, as I said, in part because it's cost-effective, versatile, and has unique characteristics like, like durability, versatility, thermal mass, low maintenance, fire resistance, energy efficiency, and low CO2 emissions when compared to other construction materials. Uh, the figures on durability are all in, in many papers. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we can discuss in, in another opportunity or in this opportunity. I just want to highlight one. Uh, concrete roads can be designed for 15 years or more, and they last around three times longer than um, asphalt or roads before a first major rehabilitation is required. So it can be less expensive at the beginning of the investment, but of course, in the long term, is a very, very efficient investment. Um, to, to end up, I would like to uh, mention the CO2 absorption. This is a, a report, recent report from IPCC titled Climate Change 2021. And it basically <coughs> teaches um, or oh, it has confirmed that concrete is the only building material that absorbs CO2 over its lifetime, an attribute that boosts the sustainable performance of our main end products. It doesn't mean that we're not doing anything else. Of course, we're doing lots more in the production, uh, in the production process, but um, these uh, findings of this research, which I will send you the information, of course, are very um, good news for us. Um, I, I have a, a list of another other uh, sustainable attributes of concrete, uh, which I'm going to mention, and I really finish with this. Concrete is 100% recy recyclable, although more data, um, transparency, and robust life cycle standards are still needed to cover all the emissions in the in the built environment and independent 19. 2019 report from the International Institute for Sustainable Development um, says that carbon accounting gaps in the build environment, sorry, that was the title of the report, emission, em, emission omissions, suggests that when all those emissions are taken into account, concrete embodied carbon footprint could be up to 6% less intensive than all food products. That is a global position paper. Concrete reflects um, reflects up to three times more sunlight than alf than than uh, asphalt, reducing surface temperature on sunny days by 15 degrees centigrade or more. And this, of course, is a result very much uh, friendly to the environment. I think I will finish with this. Uh, thanking uh, Chatham House again, chanting, uh, uh, congratulating the, the, the bank's uh, researchers. I'm sorry I couldn't do this in Spanish. I, I promise I'm, I'm far more fluent. 
<laughs> but um, I have enjoyed this very much because it's Chatham House, because it's the bank, and because this is a very, and this is a message for the bank. These messages and these research products are very important for our countries, for government officials, for policymakers, and for the private sector. This is not the private sector who is saying this. This is a research body uh, coming from the Environment and Development Bank, a very, very rigorous uh, work that is basically highlighting, once again, the importance of investing, doing it well, doing it for the people, and doing it in a resilient way. I finish that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Beatrice. I, I just want to underscore what, what Beatrice said, because infrastructure is one of those things that sort of gets lost in the other debates about development. Um, but yet it's essential uh, for the reasons that were just described in terms of social inclusion, even in terms of environment. Um, now, if you have any questions, please uh, write them in the Q&A box. And we have one right now from Christopher Reeves, and I'll read it out to you. Um, and I'll let whoever wants to take the answer first. Um, the question is, is a direct investor in Greenfield P3 in Latin America, I would, I would be keen to hear how the public procurement process can be enhanced to include greater consideration of value enhancements to deliver positive outcomes beyond absolute project costs, including clarity on where projects might be supporting a country's own NDC and SDG targets. So how do you allow for these uh, beneficial impacts um, of particular investments or projects in procurement? How can you better incentivize those considerations? Any, any takers first? Andy, you're nodding, so I'm gonna give it to you first. Well, I think uh, Thomas might have more to say about the actual procurement process, but I, I mean, it's a good question, actually, I think, a very good question. And I think, uh, you know, there's a real challenge there, right? Because, um, uh, you know, it, it, it requires a system where, uh, whereby, you know, there's communication between different government agencies, right? Um, which is a challenge uh, in, any, in any country and, and certainly a challenge in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I mean, first of all, to create, um, you know, a, a sustainable, you know, decarbonization strategy, which we talk about in this book, and the IDB has talked about in many other publications, which some countries have done very effectively, and others are still on the way of doing. And that requires then, you know, a, a national plan, and, and then to be able to implement that national plan going from top, the top right down to, uh, as the questioner suggests, individual procurement. Um, and, and that is a real management challenge, I mean, in any public sector. So it's a, it's a good question. I think institutions like the IDB can help because we, we, we have a, uh, we, we basically work across all sectors and we're, uh, one of our roles in a way is, is to help those kind of coordination problems and issues and ensure that there's consistency across uh, what different uh, agencies are doing. But I, I, I'll also, yeah. Thomas, I'm sure uh, we'll have Yeah, let me uh, just compliment briefly. Um, the, the book, what the book highlights is the need to update uh, procurement uh, processes and, and regulations in, in countries. And precisely because they, um, the systems are heavily biased toward inputs, uh, defining concrete inputs in, in construction instead of focusing on the service. Um, and, and I go back to uh, the words that um, Beatrice shared and uh, with the example of concrete versus asphalt and say uh, the government shouldn't specify if a road is built with, uh, you know, concrete or asphalt, just say, look, I need this level of service and you private sector deliver it the best way and the most cost effective way um, you can and there you leave uh, room for for improvement, uh, for innovation, for uh, value creation. So that's uh, the way forward. It's not easy. It's hard to change uh, legislations and, and, and all sorts of, of regulations, but uh, we are working hard with countries to, to make it happen. On this point, let me ask uh, questions. Obviously, the IDB and Beatrice, I don't, if you have a question and answer two to this, I'll let you jump in. But you know, generally speaking, obviously, the IDB has a number of functions. One of them is research. Another is policy dialogue, and the other is obviously lending. Um, now, of course, those different functions don't always uh, uh, cooperate, let's say, or learn from each other. So we all agree the world would be much better if, if policymakers listen to research a lot more. But what would you say if there were one thing drawing from your report that the IDB and governments and the private sector should be doing in terms of just a policy dialogue? I mean, obviously, they'll be integrated with across the 
the loan portfolio, many of these ideas. But what would be that one policy recommendation you would make based on this report? Andy? Well, I, I think improve the investment framework, and but that's a you know that's a very general statement. So that, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of detail involved in that. But but I mean to uh, just on your general point, you're absolutely right. I mean I think MDBs their role is precisely what you say. Yeah. It's the combination of these things. It's the combination of lending and of uh, knowledge, right? And uh, you know if we if we were just knowledge and had no lending, we'd be a bit like McKinsey's. Uh, if we were just lending with not so much knowledge, we'd be another commercial bank. So our value added, if you like, is precisely the combination of these two things. And, and in fact, I think also our preferred credit status, but let's not get into that on the financial side. So, so I think if we, you know, our role is precisely to try to put these th two things together. And I think this book is an excellent example of that. Um, and, and Tomas, who works in more of our lending area, can, 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 can talk to how this book has actually influenced and, and helped um, uh, IDB policies uh, and dialogue with uh, uh, policymakers in, in the region. So this book is, an, if you like, a, a very good encapsulation of that particular, of, of our role. Tomas, do you want to, Beatriz has her hands up. Hand yeah, up. Beatriz. Uh, Tomas, do you want to quickly answer? Beatriz, go ahead. Yes, very, very shortly. If I have to pick Andrew and Thomas, if I have to pick one word, I would make a, a call for transparency. Um, at the bank, you know very, very well the millions of dollars that this region has spent um, in infrastructure. And um, I'm not very sure that the impact uh, has been as, as uh, is, has been equivalent to the amount that has been invested. And we do know there are lots of problems in many countries um, of um, um, corruption associated with public work or with infrastructure uh, building. So I would make a call for transparency, uh, fight against corruption, and the bank has, of course, uh, many ways of doing it, and in fact has, has, um, has done it with, um, uh, with um, experts and, and people who are very, very, very high level to, in this discussion. So transparency would be my key word for the future of infrastructure in the region. Thank yeah. you, Beatrice. Tomas. Let me, and where I cannot agree more with uh, Beatrice, um, just to share with you that um, the IDB is working the development of transparency principles jointly with an expert group um, hosted by the Inter American Dialogue. Uh, we hope in, in the next uh, few months to be, be able to share the, the result of this uh, work. And um, we all hope that the transparency principles can be mainstream in our lending uh, contracts or instruments. Uh, and then on, on going back to uh, the main um, messages is that um, we need to improve, uh, the region needs to improve all stages of the project cycle of infrastructure. We need to do much more in planning and building consensus of uh, what infrastructure countries need instead of uh, you know, changing uh, projects and plans every time an administration changes. Again, following the, the example of uh, I-bodies in, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. And then um, we have to work more and more with governments uh, to help them um, prepare and respond to the emerging uh, changes, which are um, very important technological changes that are really disrupting the provision of services in a, in very fast. Uh, so to that end, regulation, economic regulation has to change. Thank you. Uh, we have a question actually on that topic uh, from Catalina Kaido. The authors mentioned the importance of digital transformation in the region and 5G deployment will be central to this transformation. 5G, 5G infrastructure deployment, however, will be cost intensive. What are your thoughts on attracting investment in this specific field? Connected to this point, do you have any views on how geopolitics is playing out in the region or how it may hinder or benefit the region in terms of attracting investment for infrastructure? Um, Tomas, let's go with you first. And then... Yeah, um, I guess, um, yeah, to foster innovation in digital infrastructure, uh, I guess uh, the first uh, step is to have national broadband plans. Uh, as we mentioned in the presentation, that uh, 
looks for uh, venue, avenues to um, improve and enhance competition uh, and, and bring uh, more players to the to the market. There is uh, here uh, disruption coming from um, non-traditional companies in the um, uh, service provision in the infrastructure provision uh, sphere. There is, uh, say, examples of Google, Facebook that are disrupting the the broadband uh, market. So we need to to embrace uh, competition, but not only work on the supply side. It's very important to work on the demand side of the uh, of the market. That is affordability is an issue. For many, many people, and especially in the poorest countries in the region, the infrastructure is there. The problem is that uh, people cannot afford to pay for the services. So we, we can't shy away from uh, subsidies. In this case, subsidies might be good if they are well targeted. Uh, and then we need to um, work on uh, digital literacy. Uh, and one way to do that is to um, increase the um, um, or the, the services, the digital services provided by governments. So to to uh, foster demand. Thank you, Andy. Did you have any comments on this point? Well, on the second part of the question, which of course is is, is a uh, yeah. an interesting one. Uh, of course, politics is always uh, is always there. Um, but you know, as we as we point out in the book, I mean, this has tremendous opportunities. There are huge opportunities here uh, to yeah. not only stimulate growth but also to uh, reduce inequality and and um, uh, and as Thomas just said, make services more affordable. So um, you know, we do hope that we can uh, see through the politics, if you like, or the politics then recognizes that there are these opportunities. And uh, and we uh, can uh, provide better services for all. Beatrice, did you have any comments on this? Um, no, I, I have a, I have a final remark. I was thinking um, after COVID or in during COVID, we were able to operate in most countries, the infrastructure sector, the construction sector. So we do have to say that this is, I mean. The situation would be far worse in the whole world if we didn't have the opportunity to, to be able to work in infrastructure. As I said, except for a couple of months in a few countries, we kept our operations open. And we basically did lots of fast research and finding out that we were, only, we were not only essential, but safe because we work in open spaces because the density is very low. Um, there are many other characteristics of the, of the construction work that makes it easy to survive even in circumstances like the COVID. And of course, we're happy and grateful to be able to contribute in the um, generation of employment in that situation. Thank you, thank you. Um, so thanks to all of you. Uh, I, you know, one point that you made to it, I think is really worth repeating, which is the regressive effects of the lack of investment in infrastructure. Is it, it's the poor who feel the effects more. Um, and as you talk, spoke Tomas also about you know, the, the tendency now to pull back into, if you will, sort of micro grids or smaller units, um, risks sort of, if you will, having richer communities, better off communities being able to help indirectly sort of subsidize electricity access and other forms of infrastructure access. Uh, and that's troubling. Uh, I say this in part because we're working on a project with um, a rebuilding Venezuela's electricity sector. Uh, and that's um, obviously going to be quite a challenge, but one in which the risk is the balkanization of the electrical sector, electricity sector, as a result of people opting out of the overall grid. So it's going to be key. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for this. Uh, this is great. As I say, I hope we continue, continue to feature Again, some real cutting edge and important, and unfortunately often overlooked research that you do on key topics um, to get them into the discussion in the UK. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the Latin America Initiative is new uh, in Chatham House. We're trying to inject a discussion on Latin America into the UK. Uh, we're supported by HSBC, BTG Pactawal, Karen Energy, um, as well as uh, Equinor. 
So um, thank them for, for the support and we hope to continue to collaborate with all of you. Malcolm, thank you for making this introduction. Andrew, thank you for suggesting this. So, Tomas, thanks for tuning in. And Beatrice, thanks for your collaboration on this. Um, please, uh, the publication is just, we just posted it, is downloadable that you heard discussed. So you can go there and read up on it uh, on your own. And uh, thank you all very much again, Andy, Tomas, Malcolm, and Beatrice. And thank everyone for joining. Um, let's uh, continue this conversation. Thank you.